It's Lucy Litch, and this is Tiny House Conversations. It's the Australian-based podcast where I interview experienced tiny houses, tiny builders, and adventurers in the tiny world, so you can discover how to create, build, and transition into tiny life. Before we get into the show, I want to know something. Are you a tiny houser and would you like to share your tiny house story and experiences on the podcast? Or are you a business that has a product or service that aligns with the tiny house movement and would be beneficial for the tiny house community that you'd also like to share on the podcast? If so, I'd love to hear from you and you can head over to tinyhouseconversations.com and on there you'll see a section that says share your story. If you fill out your details there, I'll get back to you very soon. Now, here's the intro. Hey, it's Lucy here with another episode of Tiny House Conversations. Today, I'm speaking with Anthony Smith from Western Australia, who is an environmental engineer and the founder and director of Water Wally, Australia's leading environmentally conscious wastewater management specialists. And you'll hear lots of passion and valuable insights from Anthony as we dive into composting toilets, grey water systems and wastewater management. And in this conversation, we talk about water as a precious resource, the different types of composting toilets and finding the one that works best for your needs, composting toilet ventilation, the importance of reusing and responsibly managing grey water. We also touched on the grey areas around regulations or wastewater management and composting toilets. See what I did there? And so much more. Now onto the show with Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Welcome to Tiny House Conversations, and thank you so much for being here with me today. No worries, Lucy. Thanks for chatting with us. So, Anthony, you know, as a, an environmental engineer and, and a, the founder of Water Wally, I'd love if you're able to start by sharing your story with us. You know, where did your interest in you know, consciousness around the earth and the environment stem from? And you know, ecosystems and sustainable living, what made you decide to go down this path? Well, it's been a lifelong journey, I guess. If you want to go back to the very beginning, it was always a passion of mine as a kid and growing up, uh, spending time in the environment. And I don't know where it, where it actually came from in the beginning, but I always had that sustainability mindset even as a kid you know wanted to make sure that that I was doing the right thing by the planet basically and then you know moving forward from there I ended up doing uh environmental engineering after I left school and that that was sort of a case of right I've finished school now I've got um good enough score to do something at uni is that what I should do yeah I guess so (laughs) so I went ahead and did environmental engineering and once I'd finished those studies I was sort of in a headspace where certainly sitting at a desk tapping away at a keyboard wasn't for me so I sort of thought well you know working you know now now that I'm a qualified engineer working as an engineer doesn't really suit me so I took off and did what you do at that age and and travelled around Australia and overseas a bit. And I guess that's probably where it really started for me properly. That's where I, you know, I I travelled to a lot of uh, remote places, particularly in Australia. Most of my travel was in Australia. I did also do a stint in Canada and and USA. But mostly I travelled Australia and spent a lot of time on uh, remote self-sufficient properties I did a lot of woofing for anyone who's heard of or knows what woofing is. It stands for Willing Workers on Organic Farms. Um, There's actually a guy at uni who introduced me to that. So I spent a lot of time working and living in these sorts of places where, you know, being remote, uh, being self-sufficient was critical. And I really took an interest in uh, the innovative and interesting things that people were doing particularly with uh, water and waste and and wastewater management and you know living or, or being on these properties where water in a lot of cases was 
relatively scarce, being resourceful with with your resources and and water was an essential thing. It wasn't it wasn't a, a feel good you know eco warrior sort of thing. It was something that that was critical to survival in in these remote locations. So you know the things that that I saw were that, that that have followed on into my line of work were things like uh recycling grey water and uh using waterless toilets so those are the two things i mean there's lots of other interesting and you know really awesome things that i saw people doing but those are the two main um components that i took from it that that now is a focus of my work in waterwally you know, you were talking about the, the conservation of water there, and I'd act- actually love to, before we dive more into, you know, wastewater management and compost wa- waterless toilets, is to take a step back and actually just talk about water itself for a moment. You know, like it's it's such a, a precious resource, and I think that many of us that have, uh, you know, lived in and say a more westernized city-based lifestyle uh, you know where where there's sewage and we're kind of removed from what happens to our wastewater and and to water and all of that like are you able to just from whatever level or depth you'd like to talk about you know water being this really precious resource for all of us you can sort of look at it in two two ways one is looking at water as a resource and understanding that, you know, that water that comes out of your tap doesn't come from thin air. Um, There's a limited volume or limited uh, supplies of resources on the planet and and we've all got to share the the water that that is available. Um, You can think about it in a way that the, the water that we have now is essentially the same volume of water that's always been available on the planet it's not increasing it's not decreasing much you know there's there's some minor variations but essentially the volume of water that we've got now is the same volume of water that was on the planet when the dinosaurs were walking around and you know as population increases it's it it is going to become more and more critical that we are resourceful with the water supply that we have available. So, you know, it's simple maths. The more people that, that we have on the planet sharing that same volume of water, the the cleverer we need to be about how we use it and, and particularly making sure that the water that, that we do use is not wasted. And then that's where you can look at the other component of, of water management is, is wastewater management. So you know calling it wastewater to start with can can be problematic mm. uh, just from just from a mindset point of view if we manage it in a in a clever way it doesn't necessarily have to be wasted and that's a little phrase that that I like to use often is it's not wastewater if you don't waste it so that you know that's something that is across the board you know that managing water is something that everyone can play a role in and i'm talking about from you know remote self sufficient properties in the middle of nowhere where you know managing water was critical like i said before through to anyone who's living uh right in the middle of the city maybe in a little townhouse where you know you still can if you've got a little garden even a balcony garden you can reuse your grey water as an irrigation source and it's sort of a no brainer it's you know why why would you not use that water as an irrigation source it's there it's free it's available your garden needs it put it on there that sort of mindset if you get what i'm saying yeah absolutely i mean even words are powerful too and you know even the the label of it is uh, something to be said for that and i love how you said that it's not waste or if you don't waste it it's it's so true when it is that perspective shift and also you know i was thinking about how you know water literally is life as well it is this life force and energy source and we're made of water and and the earth is as well and all all living beings and so 
you know, if we have this deeper understanding of it, that it's not even just a resource, that's maybe part of um, mm. our human experience of, of managing it um, in our daily lives, but that it's also this, yeah, this life force. And if we can think about it in those ways, hopefully it helps in some way or on some level to help us manage it and and be more respectful of it and be more mindful of how we're using it in our day-to-day lives and and uh, whether it's you know through lots of little micro things that we can do in our lives or whether it's using things like waterless toilets and having these different systems in place um you know in a, in a sustainable way so i love that you you talked about it in in that mindset shift and and I feel bad about calling it wastewater now. <laughs> um, ah. You know, if we're talking about the different types, so you, men- you mentioned grey water there and then there's, there's black water too, but can you talk a little bit more about those? Uh, we can say that, yes, wastewater can be split into two categories or come under two definitions, two terminologies. We've got black water and that is essentially... Toilet water. So by definition, black water is the water that it's used in your toilet to to move your waste from A to B. So toilet water. Um, and then grey water is basically everything else. It's the water from your laundry, your bathroom, your hand basins and your kitchen, kitchen sink. There is, and this is where I, I really come across um, some confusions almost on a daily basis talking to people all around Australia about grey water and what you can do with it and how do you manage it. There's some confusing definitions around different types of grey water and what you can and can't do with it. And it's sort of hard to describe uh, without going into great detail, but one, one factor that, that does play a big role in the, in the definition differences is kitchen water so i would definitely um say by definition great kitchen gray water is still a gray water but it's often managed in the same way as a black water and what i mean by that is gray water if you exclude the kitchen water is really great as an uh, you know a garden irrigation resource Uh, but kitchen water typically has high levels of fats, oils, greases, stuff like that, and that can be problematic from a garden irrigation uh, point of view. So typically, kitchen water is excluded from grey water if you're to be using grey water as an irrigation source. If you're talking about managing grey water as a whole and where that would come into play would be if you were, for example, using a waterless toilet, then you've got the remainder of your wastewater is your grey water and that will include your kitchen water. So that it's something that still needs to be managed in some way. So that's the two components of wastewater, black water and grey water. And you can, in some cases, eliminate the black water from your waste stream completely using a waterless toilet and then you've just got grey water left to manage. You know, with people that are looking at building or buying a tiny home, and composting toilets and, and black water and grey water, these are the types of things that come up that people, especially if maybe mo- when moving in towards this lifestyle, it's something that's completely new for them. So it, needing to kind of really understand the basics of it and like what actually, are, are, you know, you're going to do with it when it comes to moving into your tiny house. So that that's really great. Thank you. And you know, if we're able to move a little bit more into these compost uh, waterless toilets, uh, because it is a, a really probably one of the most frequently asked questions. Um, there's lots of different things within this space um, that tiny houses or curious tiny houses are, are wanting to know more about. I think it's really important for people considering their options to understand how to approach what the options are. And I'm, and I'm thinking back to Tiny Homes Expo that I presented at for, you know, for people in relation to, you know, ha- how to approach wastewater management in general in tiny homes. And, and what I find is sometimes an issue or maybe not an issue, but 
a bit of a mistake that that some people make early on is is jumping to the solution before considering how they got there so you know yes a lot of people use waterless toilets or composting toilets in tiny houses and for a huge percentage of people that that is the best solution but it's not necessarily always the best solution so understanding what your options are and you know you can consider that in some cases flushing toilets are a, a better or more suitable solution depending on circumstances there are other waterless toilets on the market there's incinerating toilets and that's just one component of it is is the toilet and then managing the grey water is typically a little bit trickier and that is because it's so site dependent so one point that I was really trying to get across again in that tiny homes expo was that understanding your site and your site and soil conditions is really the first step in in then deciding upon which wastewater management system is suitable for your circumstance and your needs it's a balancing act so you've got the two main components one is the tiny home and the people that are living in it or the people that are using it and and there'll be a certain set of circumstances or needs that that you know is going to suit them the people and the home itself and then there's the site and soil conditions and that's a constant so it's a balancing act between those two factors to then decide upon which is the most suitable wastewater management setup and also something definitely worth pointing out here is all of what we're talking about here is is relevant to off-grid living so if you are in a in a, in a spot where um, there is a connection to a town sewage available it's more often than not the the most suitable cost effective best solution to to hook into that as your primary waste management setup to, to hook into a town sewage system. There's definitely other things that you could do. Uh, you know, you could certainly still reuse your grey water for irrigation and stuff like that. But what all of what we're talking about with waterless toilets and, and other grey water disposal types of setups is mostly relevant to off-grid living where you don't have that connection to a sewer available. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for um, differentiating that. And, you know, you you did talk about deciding like what the best option is for each person, depending on what they've got available, what's on their land. Um, are you able to go into the different types of, because I know there's a few different types of waterless composting systems. Are you able to share a bit more what they, what they are and how they work? Yeah, well, certainly the most popular and in in most cases the most suitable um waterless toilet option is is the good old composting toilet and i say good old because it's certainly nothing new um it's it has definitely you know the composting toilet is something that's grown in popularity a lot over the past few years and particularly has grown a lot um since the the growth in popularity of tiny homes so i've been working in this space for more than 10 years now and i don't work with um just tiny home you know tiny home owners and stuff like that i work with all sorts of setups from smaller family type uh residential wastewater management systems through to larger commercial um setups and schools and community centers and stuff like that but yeah, where, where I've seen a big growth, particularly in the last couple of years, is in in the tiny home industry, and that has a lot of challenges with wastewater management. And the re- well, one of the reasons it has these challenges is because we're talking about small scale everything, including wastewater management and one of the reasons it it provides challenges is because in in regards to regulations the regulations basically haven't caught up and this is you know across the board in tiny homes from my understanding of the whole tiny home industry is regulations haven't caught up with what's going on and and wastewater management's no exception so 
essentially to to comply with regulations if that's what people are needing to do and and you know let's be honest and recognize it in a lot of cases people are not in a position where they necessarily need to comply with regulations but if you are it, it's tricky to do because of um, the way the regulations are set up essentially if you were to comply with regulations currently in more cases than not if you're building a tiny home and, and doing a wastewater management system that complies with regulations it is going to be uh, probably over engineered or, or just bigger than than what you essentially need for that type of setup back to um, composting toilets it's because of that scale of operations that that using waterless toilets makes a lot of sense because it's small infrastructure and allows for small impact and it reduces it reduces impacts it reduces inf infrastructure um, and in, in, in most cases it will reduce cost of setups as well so it's going with that waterless toilet option just fits in really well with with going small basically going tiny yeah, so I know there's some self-contained units and then there's split systems and things that have like urine diverters and all of that, micro flush systems too. So do you, um, you know, have much to say on those and maybe which ones would typically be more suitable? Like obviously people have to, to work out what, what their needs are and what's best for them, maybe how many people and, and, and all sorts of different things. But, yeah, how can someone work out which kinds are, are best for them? It's a good question and it's something that comes up for me all the time. What I can say is with composting toilets within reason, um, bigger is better. And, and the reason that I say that is that essentially we're relying on a natural process to, to take place and that is the composting breakdown process. And that is a process that takes time. And there's really not much that you can do to, to speed that up. So having a bigger volume of compost allows the time for that compost process to occur. And also uh, a bigger volume actually generates the environment or generates conditions that, that allow that composting process to happen more effectively so a good way to sort of describe it is if you imagine your little bench top compost bucket that we where you might put your kitchen scraps in there's not that much composting happening in that little bucket it's basically a bucket full of food scraps and that is similar to what's happening in a small self-contained toilet versus when you take that bucket outside to your your backyard compost bin whatever that might be but it's obviously a bigger pile or a bigger space for compost then those composting conditions happen much better so to to describe what we're talking about with composting is allowing the conditions and providing the right food sources for composting microbes microscopic organisms to to thrive and do their thing so having a bigger volume um, allows them the essentially we've got a, a little ecosystem so we've got a bigger ecosystem happening we've got different species of microbes um, in a bigger space and it it works better with the bigger volume so I guess to answer your question about you know self-contained toilets versus split system ones where the composting chamber is below the floor um, I wouldn't say that you know one is better than the other it it's horses for courses you know different setups are suitable for different situations but having said that the smaller self-contained toilets are, are typically more suited for uh, less frequent usage um, not to say that you, you you can't use it as you can't use a self-contained toilet as as your main toilet it can certainly be done it just takes uh, more frequent maintenance from you as the toilet user or, you know, whoever's maintaining the system. 
that's something that is a big factor in deciding on what to, is most suited is are we talking about a caravan that's on the move or are we talking about a tiny house that's going to be semi-permanent and, and stopped in one place for a long time? Beautiful. That's that's good to know because I know, again, like a, a lot, just speaking to a lot of different people and seeing questions online, you know, people are always asking like which kind is the best, what brand, what type. And, you know, as you mentioned, it really depends on what, what the needs are, like if it's going to be something that's in a home that's maybe like a weekender that's not used very often or if you've got like a family living there full time or, or, or yeah. things like that. So which one would you think would be better then? Like for if it was for someone that's more permanent, maybe like a couple or something full time. If you were going uh, permanent, I, I would say that bigger is better. So going with yeah, the split system. Okay. Yeah. with a composting chamber below the floor is a much more user-friendly yeah. solution. Yeah, when I say user-friendly, I say in that in two ways. One is that um, it's less frequent maintenance from you as a homeowner and also you're a bit more removed from the pile of poo. Yeah. So, you know, with a split system toilet, you're sort of just lifting the lid and looking down a dark hole, whereas with a self-contained one, you're lifting the lid and, and looking at a pile of poo. But we've just recently teed up with the manufacturer and, and have produced our own branded product. So it's a, it's a first for us at Water Wally is we've developed our own Water Wally product, which is called the Wandering Wally. And it's a composting toilet uh, designed for that mobile home sort of usage. So it fits into the same category as the separate tiny. And essentially the design of it is the same as the separate tiny. So if I was going to recommend anything to anyone, I mean, that's the one I would one. recommend. Yeah, there's, yeah. Obviously, there's obviously bias in there because it's our product, but it also comes from a point of view where I've spent more than 10 years working with all these different products and have just been able to observe the, the pros and cons and the things that are really important in the design. I guess if you were to compare that as an example, the, the separate tiny with our wandering wally, it's just been made a bit bigger. So okay. it's got no frills. There's no moving parts, which is one of the issues with something like the really popular one that has that, you know, moving mechanism and stuff like that. So what our wandering wally is, is essentially a larger bucket than the tiny. Um, it looks like a normal toilet, which is a thing that we got a lot of feedback on. So we've done the Wandering Wally to look like a normal toilet um, and it's just got a decent size bucket in it and a liquid collection chamber. You know, um, you just said before like you're a bit biased, but I'd also imagine that if you're putting your name on it, you're, you're going to want it to be, you know, of good quality too. So I think it's it's fair enough for you to say, to, to say that. And... You know, I'm wondering as well, because one of the other common things that people ask and talk about and are maybe sometimes even, even concerned about is the smell and also like the emptying processes and, and that type of stuff. And I know ventilation is something that's really important when it comes to this. So are you able to share a bit more on that and what your thoughts about that? Yeah, for sure. So I think for people who are totally new to the idea of composting toilet. It's good to understand what what's actually happening. And I sort of touched on it just before, but essentially we're making the conditions that are right for composting microbes to do their thing. And, and what those conditions are is, one, they need a, a balanced diet is one thing. And what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about there is carbon-nitrogen. So anyone that does any backyard composting will know that, you know, that's, something that's important in, in allowing composting conditions to happen. So we've got uh, a mixture or a ratio of carbon and nitrogen and how that's balanced in a composting toilet is by adding a carbon-rich material, so wood shavings or something similar to that. And the reason we're adding carbon is because the, the human waste, your poo, is a nitrogen-rich source or nitrogen-rich material. So we're adding a carbon-rich material to balance that out. And next condition, next thing that we're trying to achieve is, is the right moisture condition. And, and that's typically achieved by 
some sort of excess liquid drain. Uh, there are different ways of approaching that, but that's the most common in a composting toilet. Um, and basically, again, we're, we're trying to look after composting microbes and living organisms, and they need, uh, they need some moisture, but the microbes that we want in our composting pile or our composting system are aerobic microbes. What we don't want is anaerobic microbes and or anaerobic conditions because that's when you can you can get smells so if we're creating anaerobic conditions by having uh, the right moisture content and allowing any excess liquid to to drain away then it, it'll be a relatively smell free environment and i'm cautious in saying that because we are still talking about a big pile of poo mm -hmm. so it it's not going to be you know let's be realistic it's not going to be completely smell free but as a starting point making those conditions right will mean it, it shouldn't be terribly offensive uh smelling pile but then the next the next factor in all of this is ventilation and we provide ventilation for for two reasons one is an oxygen supply and I go back again to say that, you know, we're trying to create conditions to keep these composting microbes happy and they're living things, so they need oxygen. So we've got ventilation to provide oxygen to the composting microbes. And at the same time, as an added bonus, if we're doing the ventilation in the right way, um, that is going to take any smells that might exist away from the toilet. So typically a ventilation system is pulling air down through the toilet so imagine that the airflow is coming through your toilet seat and the direction of flow is down through the toilet and then up through a ventilation system and out into into the air basically so that is one of the factors that play a role in a composting toilet being smell free and look i know having having worked in this game now for for more than 10 years it, it certainly is one of if not the biggest concern or, or most commonly asked question is what about the smell and you know i find that i can do my best to explain to people why it doesn't smell but i know <laughs> from experience that you know and, and human nature is people are still going to be skeptical and that's you know a healthy thing and the only, the only thing that I can say to people who, who are still unsure about the idea is to go and use one. And, and I can almost guarantee that if you go and use a composting toilet that's set up well, it, it won't smell at all. And people often comment that, that a composting toilet smells less than a flushing toilet, and that is because of that ventilation that that uh, backwards airflow, the air is flowing down into the toilet. And there's usually also like a, a small exhaust fan that you can install as well, right, to help with that too. That's often um, going all the time. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's, that's part of that ventilation system that mm. I'm talking about. Yeah. So uh, an exhaust fan, like an electrically driven fan is the most common there are other ways more passive or you know th there are ways to have composting toilets that don't require a power source but using that electrically electrically driven fan that you can rely on to be running 24 7 is the most common uh, way to to achieve that ventilation and to to ensure that that it's smell free at all times yeah, and just a, a quick thing. So you mentioned aerobic and anaerobic before. So just to clarify, with and without oxygen. And you did also say just then too, so there are other ways that think more passive ways for ventilation than using an exhaust fan. Um, are you able to share like one or two other ways that you can do that without having a, a power electricity source? Yeah, for sure. What I would say though, just... Uh, just as a note, is that if you were uh, looking to use a composting toilet in a tiny home, I would always recommend using that 
that ventilation that sorry that that electrically driven fan because it's a reliable ventilation source at all times a reliable airflow system but if you were say building a little outhouse or something like that which is not in your living space then then certainly you can use systems like or well, one really common setup is to have a whirly bird you know a wind driven turbo vent that you know it's when when the when the wind passes by it spins the turbo vent and that pulls air through the ventilation system um, I've actually sitting in my backyard right now and I'm looking at our composting toilet set up in the backyard and I can see my whirly bird spinning around right now mm-hmm. and that's what we rely on in that little outhouse type of setup another thing that people do is to paint the vent pipe black and what that achieves is allowing the the sun to heat up that black pipe then sets up a convection current so the hot air inside the pipe rises and then you've got the air flowing in the direction that you want um, or a combination you could have a, a you know a, a, a vent pipe which is painted black and a whirly bird on the top of it but the reason back to what i was saying before um, that, those two systems work really well um, almost all the time. But if you had a tiny, you know, a toilet in a tiny home, you don't want it to be just working almost all the time. You want it to be working all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I'm getting at there is, you know, the, the obvious example is in the nighttime, there's no sunshine, so we can't rely on the convection current. And let's say it's a still night and there's no wind blowing our turbo vent. Well, at that point in time, we've got no ventilation and that is conditions that, you know, you might get some smells in, in your tiny home. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. And, you know, something else that I know other people ask about, and you mentioned uh, slightly before talking about wood shavings and are you able to talk a little bit more about the other types of bulking materials that people use or maybe ones that you think are most effective? Um, I know there's other things like peat moss and coconut husks and maybe some other things, but do you have any like recommendations or just thoughts around those types of things? I definitely have thoughts. <laughs> and my thoughts are, and my advice to people always is, Use whatever you can find locally that's either free or or cheaply available to you. The main things that you're looking for is like we mentioned before, we're looking for a carbon rich source. So, you know, that's the one main component. And secondly, you want something that's relatively dry, not, it doesn't have to be totally uh, bone dry, but something that's relatively dry and that helps with that moisture balance. And also, we, we generally want something that has some odd shapes. So I would usually say wood shavings rather than sawdust because there's some odd shapes which allow um, little uh, pockets of air, you know, so we're working for that aerobic conditions in, in the compost pile. So those are the th- three things to, to look for. But really, it's not an exact science and using what you have that, that you have available to you is in most cases totally fine. So what, are, what I say to people is, look, if you've got, and some people use, let's say, for example, just leaf raking. You've got some, some trees around your house that drop a lot of leaf litter. We can rake that up. That's a carbon-rich source. It's relatively dry and it has some odd shapes. So that could be perfect. Sometimes there are things that, that aren't so perfect. i give one example is I've got a local sawmill here where we've got lots of uh, wood shavings and that stuff. And that for me worked most of the time, but I also found, and I don't actually understand the, 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 the finer details of the science here, but I found that using that jar of sawdust that I was starting to get some smells, really minor, but I was getting some smells through the through the colder months and i think from from what i can establish about it all is that something to do with the um the oils and stuff that they were in that you know that particular tree species that particular wood but you know the solution was just to go back to what what i've always used as a bit of a, a staple a standard and that's pine wood shavings which you can get 
from anywhere. I mean, this you know you could you can find it from a furniture maker or something like that. Um, but it is the, the reason I often tell people pine wood shaving is because it is readily available for anyone. You can get it from. Um, uh, rural supply stores or pet supply stores it's usually sold um, as a pet bedding so it's something that you can easily get your hands on but back to what I one of my main sort of thoughts on it is that it's really not an ex exact science and you can use whatever you've got available and from an environmental sustainability point of view it makes so much sense to use what you do have available rather than buying products from suppliers that get shipped all around the country. And I know, you know, you mentioned peat moss, like a lot of peat mosses comes from unsustainable sources. I know a lot of people like the idea of using hemp in, in composting toilets and the product itself is totally fine. Um, but I've also found that the hemp that is currently available in Australia is imported from Holland. The energy sources that goes in um, harvesting this hemp in Holland and then shipping it all the way over to Australia just so that you can basically throw it in your toilet, it certainly isn't ticking the, the eco-warrior sustainability boxes if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. It had to travel those all those miles and there's the transportation and the petrol and the, you know, everything else that's gone into that to get to you. Well, you, exactly. And one thing, another interesting way to look at that as an example is going all the way back to what we started talking about as, you know, how precious water is as a resource and how much water has gone into that process and that transportation in getting that, that bit of hemp all the way over to you and you know it might have been shipped from holland to um the, the australian port in perth and then over to a distributor in queensland and then someone in south australia buys it and, and then it gets shipped from queensland down to them there's a lot of water that's gone into that that process and that transportation so we're, we're not ticking the eco boxes in regards to water conservation when you think about it that way. Yeah, that really puts things into perspective, actually. Um, there's all these hidden processes and resources that goes into so much of what we do and what we buy and what we consume. And so it is just really important to take a step back and be mindful of all, all the different um, decisions that we make and the things that we purchase and, and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is like what we're talking about now. And, you know, another common question that comes up and I'll, I'll maybe just ask like one or two more questions on comp composting toilets. And then we'd love to dive a little bit more into, to gray water systems and what you guys do with, with water Wally, but the, the toilet paper question, I'm sure you get it a lot. So can you talk a little bit about that? You don't have to do anything special with your toilet paper. Do you in compost waterless toilets? No. No, it's, it's just another um, carbon source. So, you know, we were talking about it before that that's one of the, one of the components of making a compost or making composting conditions right for the composting microbes. So toilet paper is essentially a carbon-based material and it will break down in your composting toilet really quickly. You know, it's, it, it can be surprising. I'm, I'm often surprised how quickly it breaks down. You know, if you've got the conditions right, uh, that, that toilet paper will essentially disappear or, or you won't be able to visually see it within a couple of weeks. Yeah, and and I guess the the most eco friendly, natural, the better, as as with everything. Yeah, I've done. I think you you mentioned Lucy. You've watched a couple of my YouTube videos, which you know <laughs> I don't do anywhere near as many as I would like to. There's a lot of really frequently asked questions, and I'd love to be able to share my knowledge a lot more, but. As you probably know, you know, trying to do things like YouTube videos mm -hmm. takes up a lot of time. Uh, but one of the first ones I did was a video on toilet paper and what do you do with toilet paper in a composting toilet. And I think last time I checked, I, I can't remember the numbers, but it, the most viewed YouTube video that I've done. And what I was trying to, one of the points that I was trying to make in that video is, yeah, using natural unbleached toilet papers is is better 
probably even more just from an environmentally sustainability point of view, but it's not a critical thing. You know, the conditions in a composting pile, including in a composting toilet, uh, are pretty resilient. So, you know, e even if you were using scented toilet paper with pictures of lovely little flowers on it, it, it will still break down in that composting process. So I would say, yeah, it's better to use natural unbleached uh, toilet papers, but not totally critical. Okay. So, it's, again, it's what you have access to. Just like one last question on, on composting toilets and, and composting, I guess, because I know it's another thing that people often ask is um, what's, what's the minimum amount of time that's best to wait until that organic matter can be used on or as compost, say, on fruit trees and flowers, and then can it be added to an existing compost pile? It's a variable. There's different ways that you can approach it. To have an understanding of that process, uh, you mentioned before, I don't know if it's on this recording or if it was we chatted about it before um, before we started this podcast, was uh, the, the Human Your Handbook by a guy named Joe Jenkins. That, that book goes into some pretty good detail on the science of what's happening in a composting toilet. And if you understand that science well enough, you know, you can be confident to know that that process, that composting process is destroying any potential pathogens and, and by doing that, making it safe to use as a compost garden fertiliser. But there are, there are variables in, in how well that composting process is happening and you can't always be sure that it's happened uh, completely. Um, but one thing that you can certainly rely on is time as, as one of the factors playing a role in this conversion process. The, the, the longer you leave it, um, the more sure you can be that those or any potential pathogens have been destroyed. And you can think about it in this way that even if that composting process wasn't happening at all, if you were just pulling in a bucket and putting a lid on it, not that you would do that, but, but if you were, the pathogens will eventually die in time or you know, die, be destroyed, however you want to sort of look at it, um, because they're human pathogens. They're something that live in human body and, and uh, you know, when we say pathogens, I'm talking about things that, that might make you sick, for example, and they, they will die when they've been outside of a human body for a long enough period of time. Most of it will happen really quickly, you know. Most of it might happen within a couple of days. Um, if you've got some, some good composting processes happening, though any, any pathogens that might be there would be destroyed within a couple of days. But to be sure, um, you, you want to leave it longer. And as a general rule of thumb, six months is what I say um, to people. It, it's not, you know, I couldn't say if you leave it for, for six months, you'd be 100% sure that all pathogens are gone. But, you know, you could almost say that. You could be really confident that that's the case. So then it really comes down to end usage. So if you were planning to use it, on fruit trees, for example, as long as no one's picking that compost up and, and touching their mouth or whatever, then then that's totally fine. And one thing to point out here is I know that a lot of people sort of have this, this concern or that, you know, it's a bit yuck, I'm using human poo to fertilise fruit trees. Well, two things I can say about that. One is to start with, we're not, we're not using human poo at all. We're using compost by this. Essentially, what we're looking at here is using one material that's been converted into another. So we're using a compost to fertilise these fruit trees. And also, even if we were using human poo to fertilise the fruit tree, there is no possibility of a pathogen to move from the soil into the roots of the tree up through the tree and into the fruit of that tree. It, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't work like that. So th there is no risk um, of, well, there's no health risk involved with using compost on a fruit tree, for example. 
Yeah, and what I think Joseph Jenkins says in in, in the Human Manure book is that um, he doesn't even consider human poo as waste. He talks about it as being organic matter or, like you said just then, compost as well, and that it is this natural process um, that I suppose we've become so far removed from. So, um, And then you did say that it can be added to, to existing compost piles, yeah? Uh, for sure, and that might be the case if you were, for example, using a little self-contained toilet where, you know, I used that example before of the, um, you know, the kitchen scraps in a little bucket on the sink. If we consider um, a self-contained toilet to be similar to that, then we might put it in an outside um, composting bay and add it to uh, your other compost material. And also worth just quickly pointing out here that I'm trying to keep this these descriptions as as general as possible to sort of cover all different types of composting toilets. But there are different types of toilets to suit different situations. And you know now that we've brought um, Joe Jenkins up, his sort of methodology that that he really promotes is is very similar to the the kitchen um, the kitchen bucket type of thing where we're not really aiming for composting conditions to happen in in the toilet itself it's more of a waste or a materials collection system and mm-hmm. then the composting process is happening outside somewhere mm-hmm. else yeah exactly yeah. exactly so you know, I'd love to switch gears a little bit and just move a little bit more back into grey water systems. So we talked about a little bit at the beginning. I know that, you know, with what you do with Water Wally, you've got different options for managing grey water. And I know that also you've got a grey to green uh, grey water management system PDF guide for listeners um, that's available for free. And you know, in there, I think that you you say grey water is the new green. Can you share and expand on that a little bit more? Great, grey water is the new green is probably more relevant when you're talking about using grey water as as an irrigation source. Um, you know, like we said before, it makes so much sense if you've got a garden that that needs to be irrigated, needs to be watered then why not use the water that if you don't use it on the garden will be wasted so that's one of the most green ways of of managing gray water when we're talking about that gray to green guide that that i've developed quite a few years ago now that that is more relevant to gray water management and grey water disposal where we're not using grey water as an irrigation source. One thing that's worth pointing out here is that grey water can be defined in different ways and the management of grey water can be be defined in different ways. So when we talk about using grey water um, as an irrigation source, that's what I'd call a grey water reuse system. When we're talking about grey water disposal that's where as the name implies where we're trying to get rid of it i don't really like using the term get rid of it because essentially you know we've just been talking about how great it is as a resource so why would you want to get rid of it but the truth of it is is there will be times when you don't need that irrigation uh, resource you don't need to be watering your garden um, all year round and, and you need some other way of managing grey water in those times. And those grey to green or that grey to green guideline that I've developed is really designed to help people who are working through that regulatory process. So for people who are building a home or a tiny home or, or, or whatever, and then needing to comply with local government regulations and, and tick all the right boxes. That guideline um, references the Australian standards for on-site wastewater management and, and describes a way that you can build from locally available materials, a grey water disposal system, which 
meets the Australian standards and, and by meeting the Australian standards, you should be able to get local government approval for. And basically what it consists of is firstly a settling tank. So we're allowing the grey water to, to run into a small tank and the purpose of that is to, to let suspended solids, so small particles in the grey water, settle out to the bottom of the tank and then any greases and fats or oils, whatever, can float to the top of the tank. So we're holding the grey water in that tank in a still in a still state for a, a period of time to allow that process to happen. And then the, the clearer or clarified water then can pass to the second stage, um, which is the land application or the um, soil absorption. So the importance of the first stage, the, the tank, is, is to get those suspended solids and oils and stuff out of the grey water. And the reason that's important is because when we go to the second stage, which is your land application, your soil absorption, whatever you want to call it, we don't want those particles, those suspended solids and stuff to be moving into that um, land application area where they can potentially cause blockages. So stage one, we're essentially clearing the water up. And then stage two, we're distributing the water into the soil. And there's heaps of different ways that that can be achieved. You know, and what we're talking about here is essentially the same as, as the age-old standard septic tank and leach drain type of system. So you could essentially run that grey water into a leach drain or a soak well or people um, used to call them more frequently uh, French drains. So it really is just um, any method that allows that water to absorb into that uh, soil profile what what i've done with the greater green design guideline is use a method of land application or soil absorption which disperses the water in a shallow soil profile so in the top section of the soil where there is the the chance for some of that water to be taken up via you know plants or, or you know capillary action and evaporated into the environment or taken up by roots and stuff and and used one last time as a resource before any of it that, that doesn't get taken up by those plants will then uh, move down into the soil profile where can people find that resource how can they get uh, their hands on that yeah, well, like I said, that's something that, that I developed years ago and I've been giving to people. There must be thousands of people all around Australia that have that have that I've emailed those plans to over the years. With Waterwally, I've just recently launched a new website and we will have those plans available as a download from the resources section on that website. By the time this podcast is published we should have that there so basically going to the resources section of the water Wally website you can download the greater green design guideline okay beautiful so i'll put that in the show notes anyway um, for anyone that wants to check that out so it's just water waterwally.com.au yeah yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, perfect. And, you know, what are some of the, the different options that you guys offer for managing grey water at Water Wally? We do a lot of work with grey water reuse systems, so grey water irrigation systems. One good example I can tell you about is just down the road from, from where I'm living here in Margaret River, there is a really big sort of world-class eco-village in, in development construction stage at the moment and all of those houses down there are built grey water ready and what that means is they, they've got separate plumbing for black water and grey water and so all of the houses and there's the 500 odd properties down there will all be plumbed in that way and and we'll be doing a lot of installations of grey water uh, reuse systems so allowing people to to access that grey water as a resource and, and irrigate their gardens with it. And we have a range of grey water reuse systems to suit different applications. They're all available um, on our website and, and we, you know, we distribute them or sell them, send them 
all around Australia. But, you know, your, your question was framed in the way of what we do for grey water management. And that, that also includes doing grey water and other wastewater design stuff for larger scale operations. So essentially what I've done with the Greater Green design guidelines is provide a bit of a, a one-size-fits-all as, as best as I could, do a one-size-fits-all set up to suit uh, smaller residential sort of developments. And even though it, that, that Greater Green design might not totally suit every situation, it, it is something that meets the Australian standards and can make things quite simple for people. You know, it, it means that they don't have to go into detailed uh, grey water design because they're just using, you know, a template standard that, you know, that will, that will tick the boxes. But when, when we talk about um, doing things on a larger scale, and I do a lot of work for tourism operators, you know, glamping and a lot of work for, which is relevant to, you know, your tiny house enthusiasts, your tiny house listeners, is I do a lot of work for tourism operators that, uh, that are setting up tiny homes on, on properties and, and a typical sort of, well, when I say typical, it's relatively new, but a, a growing sort of business model is tourism operators that, are, that, that don't own land but are leasing land off farmers or, or other property owners that have got space and and utilizing that space to set up tiny homes usually in really beautiful remote um, locations and and the tourism operators you know operate the business and and the farmer or property owner you know makes a little bit of a passive income by by allowing these operators to use that space and on in that bigger scale operation where we might be talking about 10, 20, 100 tiny homes on one property, then there is scope to design things to really to really suit that particular situation. So that's currently where a lot of my work is focused and a lot of work that I do is for these sorts of tourism operators um, where we might design. We're talking specifically here about grey water um, and that usually is well, not usually, but very often is the solution is a waterless toilet and a grey water system. And we can design the grey water disposal system, the grey water land application system to really suit the, the scale of the operation and the site and soil conditions available to utilise. Yep. And so there's a distinguishment here of managing or uh, reusing grey water as opposed to you were talking about disposal of it too. So I think that with your what you're offering with Water Wally is it's mainly the reusing, just to confirm understanding, the reusing of grey water. There's different sort of components and different focuses of our business with Water Wally. There is that uh, sales side of it and, and yes, basically the, the products that we sell uh, grey water reuse systems, but a, a big sort of focus for um, myself and and the business is is working with you know bigger operations. So you know, talking before about the tourism, the, the tourism glamping, all that sort of stuff. So that's where we do a lot more design work, and, and certainly do design work for smaller setups as well. You know, homeowners and stuff, but it just is a lot more viable uh, for when you've got that economy of scale, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to be able to keep the wheels turning. So I'm just wondering, you know, just to kind of maybe put things into perspective a little bit, because we are talking about the reuse of grey water and irrigation. And then, you know, there is, you said also a little bit before that sometimes the reality is there is, there are situations of, of disposing of it too, but do you have an idea or a rough estimate of maybe how much waste there is of grey water um, for an average household just in, in a typical system? Just kind of, I, I guess, like giving people an idea of how important it is to, to have something that is um, a more 
sustainable way to to reuse grey water as opposed to dumping it into uh, sewerage? Yeah, what I can tell you is the the Australian average figures, and that is 100 litres of grey water per person per day. So when, when we're talking averages, I, I find it interesting that you know, some people will sort of think, yeah, that, that sounds about right. And then you'll get some people that think, oh, there's no way I use that much water. And then you'll also get some people that think, I use way more than 100 litres of grey water every day. So they're, they're your average figures. If we're, you know, talking here to um, people interested in tiny homes, they might be on, on the lesser side of that. You might be using less than 100 litres of grey water per person per day but that that's the average figure for a standard yeah. sort of australian household yeah that's massive though like that's a lot you know if you sort of do some quick maths on it um mm. if you've got what four people living in the house is your 400 liters per day multiply that by a week and then multiply it by a year it's it's a lot of water a lot yeah. of water that essentially is going to waste that could be used as a resource absolutely and i think also when you're thinking about just the shortage of of water in general in in many countries around the world too it really just uh, it puts things in perspective and you know you've talked a a few times um, through the conversation you've alluded to it about the council regulations or the state regulations around wastewater management or systems and even composting toilets i know that there are um, different registered suppliers for like the waterless composting toilets and um, are you able to say a little bit more about the regulations i mean I'm, I'm assuming because like with tiny homes on wheels that are classed as caravans it's different in each state of australia but what about um, in terms of of that for for wastewater and for compost toilets because that is something to consider when someone's moving onto a piece of land with tiny homes. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, it's a pretty big topic. We'd almost have to do a whole other podcast on regulations. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> but but um, look, yeah, you're definitely right. There are different regulations in different states and there are different ways that those regulations are um, utilized or enforced usually at a local government level and to be honest with you it it really is a bit of a minefield i I do a lot of my work obviously being based in western australia Uh, a lot of the work that i do is in in western australia but i certainly work with some clients um, in other parts of australia as well and it's amazing to see how different the interpretation of the certain regulations are at different local government levels and, and even down to the the scale of you know you might get one answer uh from someone in one certain local government and you talk to the same uh, sorry if you talk to a, a, another person within that same local government you might get a different conflicting answer and, and i come across it all the time almost on a daily basis dealing with different local governments so yeah there are some more standardized or across the board regulations that apply but we're talking about something that's a little bit outside of the box when we're talking about um you know composting toilets and grey water recycling is a little bit outside of the norm for most local government um, environmental health officers so we do get some pretty interesting and different interpretations of how those regulations apply. That That is one of the reasons why that we were talking before about the Greater Green Guideline that, that I've developed. That That's one of the main reasons why that refers to the Australian standard rather than any other uh, state or local government regulation because that is something that is recognised Australia-wide. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got and it is something that, you know, could be recognised by any local government regulator. So, yeah, look, it's a tricky space because it's a little bit outside of the box and there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's a lot of unknowns or there's a lot of stuff that's a bit unusual to the regulators 
who are looking at this stuff. And then you throw into the mix the fact that when we talk about tiny homes, we're doing things on a smaller scale than, than what is normal. It can be quite a tricky space to navigate. So I really think for anyone who is, you know, looking into, uh, you know, living in a tiny house or setting up a tiny house on a property or, or whatever, that it's really valuable for for yourself to to really get your head around the regulations and understand how things work before you go talking about things with uh, your local government representative or environmental health officer or whatever. So you, you need to know how things work before you start that application process or before you start asking questions. I thought that might be the case and, and everything that you were saying um, very much applies to tiny homes in general too and the regulations around those because on one hand there's a, a regulation that the state has and then in every council there's a different interpretation or a different applying of those rules and so there's grey areas and, and loopholes and things that are just really not clear but as you mentioned just there at the end it is really good to just understand what's going on and understand what these these regulations are and uh before you you know make any decisions and you know i'm hoping that changes or um you know there's a bit more clarity around all of that but yeah i think when you when you pair tiny homes and then when you pair gray water systems like what you're talking about and then compost water systems because as you say they're not the norm for most people and they are outside the box a little bit I think councils and state are not really sure what to do with them and it's almost in some ways I know in some councils like too the too hard basket so it's good to know like yeah because I wasn't um fully aware of of the case in in this space as well with with the, the wastewater and the, the gray water and the regular regulations and all of that so that's good and I, I think what I might do as well is just for everyone listening in the the show notes I'll put some resources because I know that there are some like for example with composting toilets I know that there are some ones that are certified according to regulations that are listed on um, the government website so I can just put like a few different links and if you have any as well that you that you recommend maybe we exchange those later and, and put that in the show notes for everyone. Anthony, so you do cons uh, consulting with people as well. You said you you know you work with the different tourism and and um, businesses and stuff like that. And so you're offering con consulting services around grey water systems and water conservation. Yeah, for sure. And from from a business point of view, that's that's sort of where we're focused at the moment. That's sort of what's making things viable for us, and that's. You know, really, my my strength, I guess, is in that side of things. So, yes, definitely do consultancy for a range of different clients. Uh, like I said before, it tends to be most applicable to um, to larger scale type mm. of operations. When I say larger scale, I don't mean massive, you know, but like commercial. Commercial, yeah, yeah. but yeah. but also, you know, certainly do, well, p part of what I do locally is you know, as an environmental engineer, I do soil reports. So um, I'll be later today going and digging a hole and, and looking at some dirt and, and doing a uh, what we call a site and soil evaluation for someone who's looking to, um, in this case, they're just looking to put in a septic tank and leach drains, but we need to understand uh, a bit about the soil firstly for their design of the of the system and, and size and length of the leach strains and stuff like that but also from a regulatory point of view they need to have that soil report done uh, to tick the boxes and, and get their application approved but yeah i, I do uh, consultancy for commercial applications all around australia again obviously you know a, a bit of a a focus I guess or a lot of the work that I do is in Western Australia because that's where I am and that's where I can easily get out to site but also do consultancy for different operators all around Australia and that's not specifically to do with composting toilets and, and grey water although often that is the solution that we that we land on but it's to do with 
wastewater management in general and taking it back right back to what we were sort of saying in the beginning of the conversation is firstly just you know working out what the requirements of you know the proposed development or whatever might be and then understanding the site and soil conditions that we've got to work within and then from there deciding on what is the most suitable wastewater management solution for that particular project or that setup. And, you know, as we start to wrap the conversation up today, Anthony, is there anything that you feel we haven't covered today that might be important for for our listeners to hear um, around, you know, wastewater management, composting toilets or or anything else that's related? Yeah, (laughs) I'd say there's uh, lots of stuff that would be relevant and useful to people, but, you know, into how much detail do we go? Like I said before, the, the main thing is, uh, firstly, getting your head around what your situation is and, and what what are your needs. And what I mean by that is, you know, in some cases uh, you might not have any garden or anything that needs the water as an irrigation source. And in that case, a grey water reuse system is, is not relevant to you. So you know, that's just one example of, of first identifying the needs. If you don't have a use for grey water as an irrigation source, well, grey water reuse is is not applicable to your situation. So firstly, we're identifying the needs. And then secondly, we're identifying the site and soil conditions you've got to work with. And one example of that might be uh, we've parked our tiny home right next to this uh, lovely creek line, which is the perfect spot to put it. But We've got the challenge of, you know, we've got a creek line at the front of our tiny house. We don't want to do the wrong thing by the environment. We don't want to pollute that waterway. So that's something that we need to consider in our wastewater management design. What is going to be most suitable for that site and what what design components would we need to include in that scenario to, to make sure that we're... Um, not impacting on the environment with our wastewater management setup. Yeah, for sure. Now, we mentioned it once before, but where's the best place for people to come and find and connect with you online or if they want to work with you or check out what you're doing? Oh, I think it would just be the website. If if anyone's interested in, in chatting further or um, whatever, www.waterwally.com dot com that are you it's the place to go i will uh, link to all of that in the show notes and even just the different things that that we've talked about and that came up today i'll put some relevant links for everyone that wants to check any of those resources out especially uh, you know working with anthony or even the gray to green guide that we talked about and you can find those show notes at tinyhouseconversations.com Uh, So, Anthony, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I I love the passion. I feel like, you know, there's probably so much more to share and and I really appreciate you sharing your story and, and, you know, all of your wisdom and for taking the time to be with us today. So thanks again. No worries, Lucy. Good chatting with you. Yeah. And if you're listening to this episode at home, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. If you want more Tiny House Conversations, stay tuned every Thursday as new episodes come out and I'll see you next time. Thanks again for listening. And if you enjoyed the conversation today, you found it valuable and you want to support the podcast, the best way you can do that is to share the love. That way I can keep bringing you more tiny house conversations to help you on your own tiny journey. So here are three ways that you can support the podcast. Number one, if you have a friend or family member that you feel would benefit from hearing these conversations, feel free to share it with them, email them, text them, send them a telegram, do whatever you need to do to share it with them. Number two, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll know exactly when the next episode is live. And number three, if you head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next episode.